way to give, but I want to just pray for that offering right now. And uh, if we can just join together with me for that, we'll, we'll take that in spirit <laughs> right now. In Jesus' mighty name, Lord, we thank you so much that we get to come together. Though it's different, we know that some things have not changed at all. Uh, you are an awesome, great, and mighty God, faithful to the day, faithful to the night, faithful all through our lives, God, and even to our very old age. And uh, we're just grateful for who you are. And God, we come together um, uh, because we need it. We come together because we're commanded to. We come together because it's the right thing to do. We come together because we like it. And we bring our offerings, God, our thanks, our, um, our prayers, and our tithes and offerings. It's all a part of the package. And I just pray your blessing on that in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Praise God. Man, that was just beautiful. Thanks a lot. Bobby and team, Heidi, thank you so much. Isn't it great that we can worship even with masks on? Amen. So masks can come off, okay? Relax. It's okay. You can take them off. It's according to the uh, um, CDC church rules. <laughs> I really appreciate the way people um, will, uh, you know, follow that protocol. I think we'll be better off for it. And, um, you know, I've never been really hung up big on submission to authority, but it's extremely important, you know. I've never tried to throw my authority around in any way, you know. Uh, it's just not me. It's not my style. But... Um, but I do believe in authority very much and know that life and um, business and entertainment and family, nothing can function without it. <laughs> yeah, so um, really thank you, everyone, for the way you are um, uh, just accepting the protocol and, and still yet joining us. Thank you for all the servants, too, in the house. Thank you for the greeters, ushers. Thank you, uh, tech team and worship team. Uh, all of this is uh, certainly possible because, um, because of you guys. Uh, I couldn't do it all alone. I wouldn't even want to. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I still make mistakes. But you know what? I want you to know. I mean, I'm 65 years old. I'm not too afraid. I don't want to make bad mistakes. I don't want to be foolish. <laughs> you know, who wants that? But you know what? I'm not afraid to make a mistake. I I'm really not. I mean, I just, you know, you just roll with it, right, Gloria? I mean, it's just easy. Come on. We get to a stage in life where, you know, you know it just isn't as important. I mean, you know, some of those hang-ups and worrying about what people think and stuff. That's the big thing, you know, sometimes, is worrying what, what people think. Particularly as you get older. <laughs> Thank you very much for that input. Yes, ma'am. I think that's what, what I was meaning, too. You know, I mean, and even when it comes to preaching the gospel, I mean, come on, what are, we, what are we holding back for? What are we afraid of? <laughs> we got the answers. Hallelujah, we got the answers. You know, again, we don't want to be stupid and foolish, but, uh, you know, by golly, if I get thrown out of Price Chopper again, it'll probably do me good. You know? I want to talk about, the, 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 all of this ties in, I want to talk about Nehemiah today. So all my scriptures will be from Nehemiah. You can turn there to the book of Nehemiah. It's right after Kings and Chronicles. And um, it's, uh, it's an amazing story. And um, I'm not going to do the book justice in one day. But I, I believe the Lord wants me to say some things this morning about the book that are really uh, also reflecting on who we are and what we are. Because we're all wall builders. Just like Nehemiah was. Nehemiah shows amazing character. You know, the Bible's full of great characters. Um, and even all their failings and shortcomings come out too. Nehemiah doesn't have an awful lot of them that we see within the context of the, the book, Nehemiah. But he uh, went through some very difficult times. And in 52 days, he marshaled a not-so-impressive crew of defeated Jewish people to build the crumbled wall of the city of Jerusalem in 52 days. 
I want to just look at how this man endured, how he motivated such a great number of people in a very difficult circumstances, uniting them under one mission to accomplish the purposes of God. And in, through it, he overcame criticism, ridicule, rejection, resistance all around him, even some terror and honest-to-goodness fear. I want us to think about that and draw a strong analogy between what Nehemiah went through building the wall and what we're doing here building a local church. You know, with the global pandemic and anarchy in our cities, we've all tasted a little terror and fear lately, haven't we? And I don't know about you, but my security's been shaken a little bit here and there in the world. Not my security in Christ, but some of those things that come and go get shaken. But of course, not many of us have really been criticized or ridiculed or even terrorized because of our faith or our work for the Lord. You know, that is something on a bigger scale we have not yet really experienced, like Nehemiah did. He was criticized tremendously for his work that he was doing for the Lord. But I'm going to tell you that I don't think it's too far off in the distant future that we will suffer persecution. And I'll tell you, there's a scripture in there in the New Testament. Paul writes it. I can't remember the exact address. Forgive me for that. But it says, all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And it, it's just the truth because we go against the grain of the world. We go against the grain of Satan. We go against the grain of the natural man. Our message is from another place, but it's true for all men in all places. There are two sources of persecution and trouble that come to us. Satan and people. What Nehemiah was really building was more than a wall. He was building a people. And that's what I intend to do here. And I know that Pastor Jake has the same heart, to build people. Nehemiah was building people out of an exiled, defeated, tired bunch of cast-out folks. He was building them, essentially, reestablishing their identity. Jerusalem, the city of David, getting the wall up to protect it. And, of course, in a few short 400 years, <laughs> the Messiah would come from that beaten-down nation come to a people that have brought, really, the promises of Abraham, the promises of heaven to the whole world. Through the Jew has come so much wonderful fruit. And, you know, here today in the chapel, I want to see people built up. I want to see your walls shored up. You need shoring up. If I need shoring up, you need shoring up. I want to prepare a people that are ready to go to the lost or the hurting and not be afraid. I want to build people that are ready for the return of the Master. So we'll look at chapter 1. The year is approximately 450 B.C. Israel scattered. Remember, they were taken out of town by the Assyrians. <laughs> now they're under Persian rule, though. Nehemiah, our hero, a Jew in exile, happens to be the cupbearer of the king. Dig that. And he hears that his city is in ruins with no protection and no help from any quarter. The Jews, they were a 
banished people at this point in time. The nation, for all intents and purposes, was destroyed. It really hardly even existed as a nation. But God is at work, the miracle worker. Even when we don't feel it, even when it seems the bleakest, God was at work. He's always at work. And Nehemiah receives a burden from the Lord for Jerusalem and his people. And we can see that in chapter 1. We'll start with 3 and 4. And I'm just going to read them here. The remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress, he hears, and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. Now it came about when I heard these words, I sat down and wept. That's a burden. And mourned for days. That's a burden. And I was fasting. And I was praying before the God of heaven. He didn't allow the burden just to cause him to go on to the Nutsyville. He did something about it. He went to prayer. It's a serious man of God we got going here. And he says in Looking a little further down, five through six, seven, and so, it says, I beseech you, Lord, the great and awesome God who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open to hear the prayer of thy servant, which I am praying before thee now, day and night, on behalf of the sons of Israel, thy servants. Confessing the sins of, the, of Israel, which the, the sins of the sons of Israel, which have sinned against thee, I and my father's house have sinned. He's including himself in that picture. Yeah, I admit the nation's in exile, and I admit they did a lot of things wrong. We basically rejected you, and I and my fathers are also sinners. And he asked for favor. Myths in seven, we've acted corruptly against thee and have not kept your commandments, nor your statutes. Please remember the word which you commanded thy servant, verse 8, Moses, saying, if you're unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments to do them, though... Though those of you who have been scattered there in the most remote parts of the heavens, I will gather them from there and bring them back to the place which I have caused, caused your name or have chosen to cause my name to dwell. You know, Nehemiah knew what God had said. Thus, he was able to pray effectively. Do you see that? This is a great model for prayer. It's a great model. No good work ever gets started, let alone maintained, without being carried on by prayer. Hear me, intercessors of this house. Be rejuvenated in your intercession. Without it, I'm going home. Without it, may as well throw the towel in. Without prayer, I don't know where we'd be. I'm telling you, Thursday night intercession, some of them are better than others. I've been doing it for a long time. I don't think I've missed very many Thursday nights. Some of you faithful prayer warriors can attest to that fact. And admittedly, some are better than others, aren't they? But when, when, when have you left and not been glad that you didn't come? I can't remember. I mean, sometimes I'm tired and I don't want to come. But I get here. It's called will power. Hmm. That's a sermon in itself. Notice repentance is a part of his prayer. 
Any healthy new work needs repentance. I don't know about you, but I know I need to repent. <laughs> you know why? Because there's sin. And there's going to be judgment. And although my sins have been paid for, I still have this problem called living my life. <laughs> right, Pastor Jake? I keep, I make an effort to keep very short accounts with Papa. Very short. You know, 1 John, the last words 1 John from the first book of 1 John are, guard your heart from idols. I think another translation says flee from idols. <laughs> Stepping out of the camera line, sorry. <laughs> he put it there for a reason. Nehemiah is standing for the Jewish people in repentance. He intercedes for himself and the people, just like we do on Thursday nights and any other time when we happen to come together, too. And that's a sign of a good leader. That's a sign of a good intercessor that can take that stand, you know. We stand in the gap for our kids. We stand in the gap for the nation or for our church. And his prayer burden turns into action, my friends. He doesn't just talk about it. He does something about it. He takes it to prayer. And then in chapter 2, when Nehemiah was serving wine before the king, he offered the wine with a sad face. We can see that in uh, chapter 2. And it came about in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King uh, Artaxerxes, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine. He was the cupbearer. And I gave it to the king. Now I had been sad in his presence. I had not ever been sad in his presence, but he was this day. The king said to me, why is your face sad? He actually was actually putting his life on the line because the cupbearer was the guy that basically tasted the wine for the king to make sure there was no poison in it because the king always had enemies. You know, So that was the job of the cupbearer. Cup it was a pretty important job. So here's Nehemiah his countenance is sad because of this whole thing that's going on and that he's been fasting and praying about. And he's showing that, and the king then uh, asks him. It, it sets it up, and the king asks him in 4 and 5. It says, you can read it in chapter 2, 4, 5. It says, uh, then the king said to me, what would you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. I'll never forget Iris Godfrey commenting on that particular verse. She called it an arrow prayer. You know, response or question, waiting for response, a quick prayer, right up to heaven. Oh, Lord, mercy, mercy on me right now, God. Favor, I need the favor of God. And he does. He gets an amazing favor. Um, uh, you know, it, it, not only does the king grant him freedom to go to Jerusalem, but he gives him permission to rebuild it. And he gives him resources. And he gives him letters to the less than friendly governors along the way. So Nehemiah could accomplish his mission without intervention from them. Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem. And in, for three days he's there. And he goes out secretly at night to survey the actual devastation that's in the wall in the city. You can see that in verse 11 of chapter 2. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. And I rose in the night and a few men with me. And I did not tell anyone what my God was putting into my mind to do. And I went out at night, verse 13, to the valley gate in the direction of the dragon's well and on the refuse gate, inspecting the walls which were broken down and the gates which were consumed by fire. In verse 17, just looking a little further down, it says, 
He, he gathers some of the leaders together and he tells them what he's found. You see the bad situation we are in, he says to the leaders that are there in the city. He gathers them together. That Jerusalem is desolate, its gates are burned by fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. What a motivation that we would not be a reproach in the eyes of the nations, in the eyes of the world. I think Nehemiah showed a lot of wisdom in surveying the condition of the walls himself and doing it discreetly and then making a call to action. He was a practical man of action and relied on his own inspection of the walls to tell them what he knew needed to be done. He didn't go just with hearsay. Leaders, this is a good principle to follow. Get the facts personally. Get the facts, and you don't need to be blowing a trumpet in Zion that you're in town necessarily. Nehemiah came in discreetly, sent by the king of Persia, by the way, but, you know, he's not wearing that on his sleeve, you know. No, no, no. He's here because the Lord has sent him, and that's good enough for him. He doesn't need anything from men. He's quite a leader. Nothing like first-hand verification of the facts. Amen? Amen? Verse 19 and 20. Well, gee whiz, you know, this is great. He says, uh, he says uh, I better wait here and just look at this in 18. He says, I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also which the king's words which he had spoken to me. Then they said, Okay, let us arise and build. So they put their hands to the good work. So in other words, he got them all on board. They wanted to rebuild. They didn't want to be a reproach. But just below that in 19 and 20, we find three um, uh, individuals, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, they start to voice their opinions, and they mock Nehemiah. These are the bad guys in the story that we're covering this morning. They mock Nehemiah and the work of the Jews, and they show disdain for them. And Nehemiah's answer is seen. I'm going to read 19 and 20 if I can now. It says, When Sanballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Geshem the Arab heard it, they mocked and despised us and said, What is this thing you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? So I answered them and said to them, The God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, we are his servants. We will arise and build, but you have no portion, right, or memorial in Jerusalem. That's Nehemiah at his best. Look at how he faces the mocking. How many have been mocked for your faith? How many have been ridiculed? And one, faith, one form or another, you know, it stings, doesn't it? It hurts. But Nehemiah puts it all on God. It's his plan. It's his work. This is too important to be sidetracked by anyone. It's too important to be sidetracked by anyone. Good principle. Let's look at our own faith walk like that. Is it his plan to build this church? Are we here? What are we here for? Thank you. There is a truth there. Coming together and worshiping together corporately is interwoven throughout the Old and New Testament. You know, I don't remember seeing, I remember seeing a lot of mature, strong believers going off with the Lord by themselves to get the mountaintop information they need. But every other time after that, I see them in community. Christ is manifested in his church. This is where the action is. This is where the men and women are going to hear of the truth. This is where they're going to get saved. I mean, they might get saved in a parking lot somewhere out there in Fayetteville or wherever. I know, I mean, that can happen if somebody's got the chutzpah enough to go out and find them and get them. But, you know, this is the place where you're built up, you're, you, where you're strengthened, where you get the calling, where, you, where you're encouraged and you're fellowshipped and you're sent out. 
Without the local church, the world probably would be toast. So the work begins in chapter 3. Chapter shows us this chapter, how many people get involved and get behind Nehemiah's wall building plans. Um, just real quickly, uh, for a couple verses there, um, uh, it says uh, in verse 1 of chapter 3, um, uh, Eliashib, the high priest, arose with his brothers, the priests, and built the sheep gate. They consecrated the wall to the Tower of the Hundred and the Tower of Hananel. And next to him, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, Zakur, the sons of Imri, built. So what we're getting a picture of here in just a few verses is that each one took a part and built a part of the wall. The sons of Hassanah, in verse 3, built the fish gate and laid its beam and hung its doors with its bolts and bars. There's progress being made in the work. Many hands are working. Each family. In verse 12, just look down in chapter 3 there. Next to him, Shalom, the son of Halohesh, the official of, of half the district of Jerusalem, made repairs. He and his daughters, his daughters joined in. <laughs> Carrying, lugging, toting. Everybody that could jumped in and helped. Broad support, my friends. The work was not by, done by 10% of the people like it is in most of the churches today, so the pastors burn out, and the elders. Here we see the truth that Dad always used to share with me, and I never really quite got it until I grew up. Many hands make light work, son. Isn't it the truth? No one could do everything, but everyone could do something. And that's God's plan for the church. That's God's plan for the church. There were perfumers, you read in chapter 3. There were merchants, priests, bakers, goldsmiths, officials, shepherds, farmers. Verse 20, you can look it up. It says this guy named Barak zealously repaired a section of the wall. He was zealous. He didn't just go out, oh, I got to do it again. No, man, he wanted to get out there. He was so excited. He was just zealous. What does zealous mean? I think I'm trying to portray it. You know, it's with passion and excitement, right? There's work to be done. Let's get to it. Chapter 4. The work is criticized even more, and the Jews are even physically threatened. Look at chapter 4. It came about that when Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious and very angry and mocked the Jews. And he spoke in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria, men of affluence. What are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish in a day? Ha! There. Can they revive the stones from the dusty rumble, even the burned ones? Do you hear the mocking? Do you hear the ridicule? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was near him and said, even what they are building, if a fox should jump on it, it would break their stone wall down. Can you hear the laughter? <laughs> you know, when, when we live our life for the Lord, often mean people who do not really have a valid argument against our life or against our work will ridicule and resort to mockery, to jokes, to humor. There's good jokes. <laughs> to humor, to try to make us look feeble or look silly or weak. They will name call. That's what these enemies of the Jews were doing, and they were doing it in front of affluent leaders of Samaria. They had a lot of popular opinion with them. You know, when I was a younger uh, man, working as I did in sales for 100 years, um, <laughs> trying to live for Christ, I was young, learning to live for Christ. I, I was just trying to live a holier life, a cleaner life. You know, holiness is an excellent thing to run after. You know, it is the call of every Christian 
because we're called to be holy and blameless from the foundations of the world. Uh, it was a difficult time for me, though, because a lot of the guys in the warehouse, they, they saw me living and how I was living, and they laughed at me, and they called me names. And uh, uh, whenever I came to the warehouse, they would start whistling Andy a Mayberry tune. And, uh, you know, the reference being that, you know, I don't know, just what it is. Um, you know, I didn't do anything wrong to them, really. Um, there was a good reason. There was no good reason, I don't think, for their criticism. Uh, I didn't break any law, and I didn't hurt them in any way that I know of. Uh, I think I convicted them. And uh, I, I think that they resorted to ridicule and mocking just to make me feel less, maybe make me doubt myself, and to make themselves feel... <laughs> Bigger, better. Are you following that line of reasoning? That's why people, that's why people do it. You know, it's, it's self-aggrandizement, trying to build up myself to make myself look better. You know, and, uh, and it was very excruciating. How many have experienced something like that at one time or another? Come on, I bet you many have. Yeah, been mocked for your faith, you know. But look at Nehemiah's resolve in verse 4 and 5. Hear, O oh my God, how we are despised. Return their reproach on their own heads and give them up for plunder in a land of captivity. Do not forgive their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out before thee. For they have demoralized the builders. What a sin that is. Let's just point it out. What a sin it is to come along and try to make somebody feel demoralized in what they're doing when you know that it's good. Somebody's trying their best back there to work. And it just doesn't come together. Don't demoralize them. Don't make them feel bad. Cool down. Calm down. Chill out, man. We're all after the same thing. Amen? That's what I've said to every leader in, in, in the last few months. Let's treat each other very specially and not try in any way to demoralize each other. We should care about each other and want to care about each other. Oh, you're having trouble? You can't get that right? Don't worry about it. I'll try to help you. But if it doesn't work, it's okay. You know why? Because we got a big daddy in heaven, and he's good to us. And you know what? He's very understanding and forgiving. And so is the pastor, maybe to a fault. Just telling you what I think. I love Nehemiah. In verse 6, he says of that same chapter, he says, um, We built the wall, and the whole wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. The people had a mind to work. The people had a mind to work. Say that with me. The people had a mind to work. Thank you. They got the wall finished to half height. The enemy is furious, furious, and they conspire to attack the Jews. Physical harm is even threatened. And look at what he does in verse 9 with that threatening. We prayed to our God, and because of them, we set up a guard against them day and night. Day and night, they sent a guard. In verse 11, the enemy said, they will not know or see until we come among them and kill them. We'll surprise them and put a stop to the work. It's terrorism. They're terrorizing them. Undetected attack. These were not trained professional soldiers, by the way. They were just Joes like you and me. I mean, some of you guys are packing, but, you know, I don't pack. I'm not a gun guy. I believe in that. I believe in guns, but I just don't. You know, these were just guys doing their job. And then now they're called to fix a wall, and they're building a wall, and they're doing a good job. You know, it's, it's an amazing thing. Verse 13 even points out another strategy. I stationed men in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, exposed places, places, and I stationed the people and families with their swords, spears, and bows. But the people were still very afraid. 
Verse 14, when I saw their fear, I rose and I spoke to the nobles and officials and the rest of the people. And Nehemiah gave them a short exhortation, which I'm going to share now with you. And this is three things he told them to do. Three things I want the church to remember to do when you're feeling insecure, when you're feeling a little bit pushed out, when you're being mocked and ridiculed, when you're not feeling up to yourself. This is what he told them. He says in verse 14, he says, uh, do not be afraid of them. (laughs) How many times does the word of God tell us not to be afraid? You know what it really means? It means don't let fear dominate you. I mean, fear is a natural emotion. As long as I'm wearing my pants one leg at a time, putting them on one leg at a time, I'm probably going to have a few times more before I go to be with Jesus when I'm afraid. But I'm not going to let it dominate me. I'm not going to make my life decisions out of it. Then he says, Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome. Hallelujah. Remember how faithful he's been for you and I in the past. Didn't we just hear that this morning from our worship leader? Thank you, Lord. Let me tell you this, too. Don't be afraid to call it out and speak it. Don't just think it. He's faithful. He's been faithful to me. He is always faithful. God is good. Declare it. Proclaim it. Stand in front of the mirror. Tell it to your wife. Tell it to your son. Tell it to your neighbor. (laughs) It's important to verbalize it. Three. Then he says, his third thing he tells them, Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Hallelujah. Fight for your families. Fight for your homes. Believers Chapel. Fight sin. Fight for your family. Fight for your grandchildren that are coming up. Live a righteous life. Build your wall. Shore up the foundations of your life so that you're living for the Lord and they can say, Grandpa, he loved the Lord. And today I'm walking in his name because of what my grandfather had, what my father had, what my mother had. Hallelujah. Fight for your families right now today in prayer, in example. Make the right decisions. Live for the Lord. Give it up. Give up the stuff. All the stuff. You know what the stuff is. I don't have to illuminate it. Give it up the stuff that you know you cling to that you can't take with you. That's not as important as eternal matters and the Lord himself. I'm telling you, everybody here and everyone out there is going to have to stand someday and give an account And I'll tell you, i got to tell you that I'm going to be held even doubly responsible because I'm Pastor Dave, Pastor Jake. We are doubly accountable. Good enough. Can we rally to a similar, similar cry? Can we rally to this? Can you stand against the enemy of your life? Stop the liar. Stop the thief. Stop allowing him to come into your life. Just stop it. Can we stop sin, stop fear? For the good, not only of our own life, but for our families, for our homes. Can we look down the path of life right now and take a stand for righteousness? Can we do that? Are you willing And after that, the response from the workers was phenomenal. They built that doggone wall. Surprise attacks were not possible because they were prepared. A man had a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other hand. And man, I'll tell you, he'd take the trowel and slap you. He'd take the sword and slap you. He would do whatever he had to do so that the work would continue. Trumpeters stood ready to sound an alarm along the wall. So if one was having trouble over here, 
They would round, gather around and help him. One neighbor helping another, different parts of the wall. They were laborers day and night, and they were warriors day and night. And they stayed and got the work done, and in 52 days, after several additional challenges and threats and political games, they built the city's wall. I'll tell you, in closing, unity towards a God-given purpose will bring God to fight for his people. Amazing favor comes to the house that has one mind on this. It's like a trigger for the anointing. Talking about defending and guns and things like that. I mean, boom, man, it's like a shot from heaven right into the arm of the leadership of a local house where the people want this. Amen? Amen. It's a spiritual principle. Can we build? Can we continue to build the wall of this church? Are you ready and are you willing? Bow your hearts with me. Father God, I just pray that we would just take seriously and consciously, intently your word and that even in my own life, first of all, Father, I would take this and apply it to my own living, to my own family, to my own quiet moments when it's only me and you, God, and what am I doing? And that we would, all of us, um, uh, take it to heart and apply it to our homes, our families, to our own personal lives. And that when we come together as a body, the bride of Christ, we, wow, man, I'm telling you, the ceiling would be popped right off. The ceiling would just explode right off because everybody on their own was after the same thing. And when we came together, it just couldn't be contained. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much.